Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitris. Let me check if you can see me. I think you can see me. And this is Deep Learning with Python, the 12th chapter. So today we will go through some generative deep learning, uh, and specifically four types. So first of all, we will start with text generation, uh, close to what we saw last time, but this time with generation, not uh, just prediction. Uh, then we will continue with never, trans never style transfer, and then we will see two very common vari variational autoencoders and the GAMS. So lots of stuff to cover. Let's start. First of all, text generation. Uh, so we explore how RNNs can be used to generate sequence of data now. Uh, but the idea is that uh, the text generation is only one case that you can use these kind of models. So the exact same technique that we will see actually right now, it can be generalized to any kind of sequence data. So if you have, for example, I want to generate music, uh, music can be a sequence of musical notes. So you can use the same technique to generate music. Uh, if you want to uh, generate, for example, uh, to make a painting, you can say that the painting is actually a time series of brush strokes data. So you can use, again, the same technique to generate this kind of data. Uh, how do we generate now a sequence of data? So the idea is that we train a model, which can be either transformer, like the one we saw last time, or RNN, like the one we saw two uh, sessions ago, uh, in order to predict the next token given the previous tokens as input. So more or less what we saw last time with small changes. Uh, in this case, we have some initial text. Uh, in this example, the cat sat on T. The. Then we feed this initial text to uh, the language model. And then we get uh, a probability distribution for the next word, for the next token. Now, uh, at this point, we have something new. We have a sampling strategy. So we have the distribution, and then we have to pick one token. And this token, based on the sample strategy that we will explain later, uh, will be the next word. Then we add the next word, the next token, to the uh, initial text, and we repeat this process. And we can stop it either when uh, we get the end prompt, the end token, or in a fixed uh, amount of, uh, of tokens that we're going to generate, like in the example we will see. So the importance of this sampling strategy, it usually uh, we, when we have classification, we use uh, something like a greedy sampling, a greedy approach, which is, okay, let's take the distribution and we take the arc max, so the argument that has the maximum distribution. However, this uh, has been shown to be quite uh, dull, quite repetitive, predictable. So the strings that come out uh, from we using only the grid, greedy sampling, it's not always the best. And that's why it's better uh, in practice to introduce some kind of randomness. Now, the problem is that we cannot just introduce randomness when we use softmax. Uh, because softmax is fixed, doesn't include something. So we have to make something a, a bit different in order to introduce this uh, randomness. And the solution is the softmax temperature, as you can see here. So the idea is that given a temperature value, it's just a parameter, then we have the softmax to become a new uh, probability distribution that is computed based on the original one. And this has new distribution, new weights. And based on this, then we sample uh, the next token. Let's see in more detail how this might work. So how we can reweight a probability distribution based on different uh, temperature degrees, temperature values. Here we have the function that we are going to use. And the whole idea is that we have the original distribution, let's say the output of softmax, and then we have a temperature value. And we just apply this, so it's just this uh, mathematical operation. And then we take the exponential and we return in order to have an actual uh, distribution, we have the sum to be equal to one. So we divide by the sum of the distribution. And this is more or less what we are going to use in this example. And here you can see how this uh, could actually function. So if we have a very, very low temperature, then all the new weights will be assigned to the most probable world based on the previous uh, uh, distribution. So you can see that this is almost everything here. But if we start increasing the temperature, the stochasticity, the uh, randomness, then you see that other uh, uh, 
other tokens can get a higher uh, value, higher value in the probability. And of course, in the end, we just randomly sample from whatever is the new distribution. So let's see how we can implement this idea on text generator, text generator uh, generation task. So first of all, let's create a data set. It's again, more or less uh, what we have seen before. Uh, nothing new here. We just uh, have the IMDB. Uh, so this is the same uh, sentences that uh, were either positive or negative. We don't care about positive or negative. We just take everything because we don't want to distinguish. We just want to generate the next, uh, uh, the next sentence. And uh, we have this thing here because uh, when we applied classification task on this, uh, we didn't care that uh, there was this uh, tag, but now we don't want to generate uh, something with this tag, so we just uh, replace it. Uh, we have 50,000 uh, samples, so and everything in one class, as I mentioned before. So lots of uh, samples to train on. Now let's prepare the text uh, vectorization uh, layer. Uh, I, Probably you remember, we just defined the sequence length. So how many tokens maximum and what will be the vocabulary size. And based on this, we take the 15,000 most common words of the corpus. Uh, let's run this. And what we return in the end is just the integer, which is the index in the list of the, uh, of the vocabulary. Uh, so just one number per token. Uh, let's set now the uh, set up the language modeling dataset. So the idea here is what will be we have this uh, text vectorization, and then we want to uh, prepare what will be the input and the target. So the idea is that we want to feed everything, the whole batch, of course, and we want to feed up to the penultimate, the one before the last one uh, element as x as input. And for the target, the Y will be from the uh, second one until the last one. So the idea is that every time we feed up to a point, we want to predict the next. And we repeat this with more and more and more. And here is what we actually do. We take this uh, uh, function and we map it to our data set. OK, so let's continue. Again, these are stuff that we have already seen before. That's why I'm uh, passing them quite uh, quickly. Now, a transformer-based sequence-to-sequence model. Uh, the idea is to train, again, the model to predict the probability distribution for the next work, word, uh, given some initial words. It can be one more or more. And during inference, the idea is to feed the model, again, with the initial prompt. It can be one word or a sentence. Then sample the next word, uh, add the next word to the prompt, and then repeat it, feed the new prompt to the model to get the new word. And we will use the sequence to sequence architecture uh, from the last chapter. So here's the idea. If we had just a next word, pred next word prediction, then if we have one sentence, we will just use the whole sentence up to uh, the penultimate uh, token and predict the last token which means that each sentence can be used only once, as an example. But here, with the sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling, we can use the same sentence many times because we just take parts of the whole sentence and we feed parts, and then we predict the next word. We feed another part of the sentence, we predict the next word. Of course, there is a big overlap, but again, there are many examples from each sentence. And this is the advantage of this sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, modeling. So here is uh, something that, again, we have already seen how to embed the position of the token in uh, the input. So if you remember, generally we have this layer embedding, which is the token embedding, which takes the index and produces an embedding of this word, of this token. But we also have this uh, position embedding that as we saw before, uh, we take the positions when we call here, and we assign the positions embeddings. And then we take these two and we concatenate them. So we take the two lists and we merge them. Uh, compute mask is actually what we saw before. We just want for the new, uh, for these uh, em embedded positions to be the same more or less mask as the other ones. Uh, so the zeros that uh, we might use for padding will, be, uh, will not be included. 
and get config is just get config to be able to replicate uh, to recall uh, this uh, model. So again, this we saw before transformer decoder. So here we will see the decoder, and again it's the same architecture as we saw before. The idea is that we have some embedded DIM, uh, the density measure, and the number of heads. And if you remember from the last time, we had two multi-head attention. Uh, so attention one and attention two. And then we had the dense projection that includes two dense layers. Uh, and then when uh, we also have, uh, if you remember, we don't use batch normalization in this kind of model, we use the layer normalization. So we have three different layer normalization because we will apply three times. Uh, support masking, of course, true. And we have how we can generate the causal attention mask. Again, this is in order for the model not to have access to the uh, future uh, time steps, the future steps of the time series that we feed, in this case, the future words, because we don't want the model to have access to what follows in order to predict the next word. So this is what this causal attention mask produces. And then we have the call. So the call is pretty straightforward based on what we saw last time. We just produce this causal attention mask. And then we have the first output to be the attention one. So this is the first head that takes three times the inputs, okay? And use the causal mask. And then we have uh, here, we have the addition. So this is a skip connection. Uh, and after we apply the skip connection, the addition, we apply layer normalization. And then we have the second output to be uh, the output of the second attention head, the multi-head. And here we feed uh, one time for the query, we will we'll have the attention output one, uh, which comes from here. So we feed this output plus the encoder outputs here twice. And in this case, we use a padding mask. Again, uh, you can see it in more detail in the previous session because we explain exactly what uh, each one of them is and why use, we use this. This is just a copy from the last session. And of course, we apply layer normalization too, and this is applied on the skip uh, connection. So we have addition of this output with the previous outputs. Uh, we have the dense projection, which is again the two layers, the two dense layers that we created uh, here, or is it here? Okay. So we apply these two dense layers, and then we have another skip connection. So let's come back. We have another skip connection. The last one, we apply layer, layer normalization, the last one, and we return the output. So let's execute this. And this will be the decoder. And here is how we can apply this uh, on a task of generating uh, text. So we generate the input, just the output of an input layer. And we use the positional embedding, uh, which again returns both the embedding of the word plus the embedding of the position of its token. And we get this X. And then we pass this uh, twice here to the transformer decoder with whatever values we want here. We take this and in the end, what we want, so this is just some way to, um, to make an embedding and encoding of the information that is useful for the existing sentence. In the end, we want to use this information from the existing sentence to generate the next word. So what we need is actually just a dense layer that will output how many words we have, just a distribution on the whole vocabulary, and we use softmax because we want to pick one. So we take this output, we create the model from inputs to outputs, and we compile, and we just use parse categorical cross entropy. So nothing uh, new here. So let's create the model. And here we will also create a callback, which is just in order to, so during the training to produce some, uh, some sentences to see how it's going. So it's training good or bad, or what different values of temperature could be uh, good or bad based on the results. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is just the sample next. Here is more or less what I explained before. So we just take the predictions, we take the array, and we apply these uh, two lines, these two operations that I showed just before, which is how to get 
a new distribution based on the temperature. And then this is how to sample from this distribution. And after we sample, we create a new uh, sample. We just take the maximum argument. And this will be the index from the whole vocabulary of the word we want to pick next. So we will use this inside here. Here is just, uh, um, just a callback that generates, uh, use the text vectorization. We take the tokenized text, we feed it to the model, we take the predictions, and then we use this prediction to sample next. And we use, this is the next token index. And we feed it to the token index uh, dictionary that will return a word, the actual word that we want to use. And what we do next is that we take the existing sentence that uh, at the beginning is whatever prompt we use. We add a space and the new word. And this will be the new uh, prompt that we will use. And we repeat this uh, for as many times as we want. In this case, I think we will use 100 uh, times, 100 new words. So this will be the original, the initial prompt, this movie, and we want the model to continue. Uh, and we, here we define how many temperature, different temperature values we want it to, to sample from. And here is the fitting. Of course, we will not fit it now. I already fitted it before. It takes some time. And here are some examples actually from uh, what you can see. And you can see these kind of examples that the output also in the book, it's more or less same. Uh, and the idea is that say, for example, this movie is uh, unknown word. Uh, of the original movie and the first half hour of this movie is pretty good, but it is very good, very good movie. So at the beginning, maybe it's not, uh, it's not very interesting when we have quite a uh, low temperature, but as the temperature goes higher, for example, 0 0.7, and you can see that it can generate something quite more interesting, maybe. Uh, this movie is fun to watch and it is really fun to watch, okay. All the characters are extremely hilarious. Yeah, it gets a bit better. I mean, of course, you can get much better results if you use something bigger. But the idea, and of course, if we continue to increase the temperature, you get something that um, starts not making lots of sense. Uh, it breaks the coherent. It's not very coherent in the end. So this movie could be so unbelievable. Lucas himself. Yeah, it doesn't make always sense again. Okay. But the idea is that, uh, again, with low temperature in this specific uh, data set and with this specific model and training parameters, uh, low temperature might predict some repetitive text, higher temperatures uh, start generating a text that is uh, more interesting. But if we go to very high temperatures, like 1.5, the local stru structure, as you can read and understand, starts to break down and it outputs something random uh, sometimes. Uh, so this is very fast. The idea of uh, how you would use something that we have already seen, the decoder from the previous chapter, in order to generate the next word. And now if you want something better, of course you can achieve this. Uh, one way would be to have a bigger model. So you can stack some of these uh, layers that we produced and not use just one layer. You can stack more layers to embed this information. Uh, you can have longer training for uh, more epochs, or you can actually use more data if you have available data. Uh, so actually GPT-3, the very famous uh, model, is broadly speaking, more or less the same, but it's a deep stack of transformer decoders uh, with many uh, bells and whistles, of course. But it's the same idea. You have the transformer decoders stacked uh, to each other, and of course you have a huge training corpus, but the main idea is the same. This is how it generates, it predicts an export. So this was for the text generation. And again, you can use the same technique to generate any kind of sequence uh, data. Now let's move to a completely different, the neural uh, style transfer. Probably you have seen something similar to this. Uh, it was introduced in 2015. Uh, there are many variations out there now. There are many applications that you can use your smartphone to download, change the style of what you see. So the main idea from for neural style transfer is that you apply the style of a reference image to a target image while conserving the content of the target image. So here we have the uh, content image. And here we have the style transfer and the style reference. 
And the idea is to keep more or less the content, so the houses and the uh, river, the trees, but to use the style of the reference imat. And this could be something uh, like the result. Now, uh, how can we define the style? How can we define the context? Uh, the, the content. The idea is that the style could be the textures, the colors, uh, or some visual pattern, patterns that are uh, in this style reference image uh, at various uh, special scales. So it can be from very small scale to something bigger that covers uh, how the brushes uh, move. The content, on the other hand, is the higher level macro structure. Uh, of the image. So there are some houses here. Again, there is uh, this river and there is the sky, etc. So these are the macro structures. So the goal would be to conserve the content of the original image while adapting the style of the reference image. And so if we can somehow uh, define what is, mathematically speaking, the content and what is the style, then all we have to do is to create a, a loss function that we try to minimize. That could be more or less this. So the first part is for the style. So the distance between the style of the reference image to the combination image, and the distance between the content of the original image to the combination image. So we have these two losses, and we just add them with some weights to produce the final loss that we try to minimize. Now, how can we define these losses? So what would be the content loss? So the idea for this is that the activations, if we have a, a, a deep neural network, for example, uh, uh, CNN, then the activation of the earlier layers in the network contain very local information because they have access to very uh, small areas. And of course, the deeper we go, the access to bigger areas it has. So the first, uh, the earlier uh, layer have access to the local information and the activations of higher layers contain increasingly global abstract information. So the trick we use here is that we take these activations and the content loss could be some distance, for example, L2 norm in this case, but you can use another one, between the activations of the upper layer, the deeper layer of a pre-trained ConvNet, computed over both the target image and the generated image. So if you take these activations that again contain global information, then you can apply some distance, like L norm in this case, between these activations of the model of the specific convolution layer. And then you try to minimize this distance because you want the global information to be similar, the upper and the higher level. Similarly, for the style, you will use earlier activations of the model. So you don't have to use just one, you can use multiple layers. So you take the activations of, let's say, three or four earlier uh, layers, and you want multiple because you want different scales. So you want both the very small scale and bigger and bigger to get the whole information about uh, these patterns. And then in order to combine this, we will use a gram matrix, which is just a, uh, an operation, an inter product between the arrays the outputs of the layers. So let's see this in practice. So how we, we can uh, apply neural style transfer in Keras? The idea is that we will do something similar to the original paper. We will use VGT19 layer activations in this case, of course, the pre-trained. And we will take the activations uh, of the model for all three images, the content, the style, and the combined. Uh, we will compute the loss, and then we will use gradient descent, of course, to minimize this loss. Again, the loss will be the combination. Uh, now, let's first of all download the images uh, so, and see the images. So this will be the two images that we will use. This will be the content. It's just an image of, uh, I think, San Francisco. And this is uh, from the Van Gogh uh, painting as style. And uh, now let's define some functions. So this is just the pre-process and the deprocess. So for the pre-process, we just want to have a specific uh, uh, dimensionality, so image uh, height and width. And we take the array out of the tensor. We, or whatever it is, the object here, we expand the dim so that we have a batch of one image, because again, we need to fit batches to the Keras model. 
uh, and we apply whatever pre-process uh, VGT19 needs, and it's already given here. So after we apply the pre-process, we return the image. And the deprocess is actually the opposite. It doesn't include the deprocess input, so we have to do it manually. This is how do you reverse this pre-process. And you just click from 0 to 255, and say integer, and unsigned integer. So nothing strange here. And let's use the pre-trained VGT19 again, create a feature extractor. So first of all, we get the model. Uh, again, Keras applications, VGT19, this is a model. And of course, we want it to be pre-trained. Uh, we will not take the top because we will just uh, we just want to generate the uh, the image in the end. It just want to take the uh, the activations of specific layers, so we don't need the top. And what we do here is that we create the output dict. So the output dict is just a dictionary uh, with the name of its layer that we want to use and the output of this layer, the activations of this layer. And the feature extractor is, it extractor is just a model that takes the inputs of the model, so just the input, the image, and it returns all these uh, activations. So it returns, I don't know, 19 maybe, how, how many ever layers it has, all these uh, will be outputs. And of course, we will keep whatever we want from this dictionary. Now, the content loss, let's see how we define the losses now. So we have the base image and the combination image. What we define here is just difference between these. We take the square of this and we reduce some. So nothing strange here. And of course, these are the activations of the image. And the style loss, here we use uh, this gram matrix that I mentioned before. It's just uh, this uh, uh, multiplication. Uh, we use the features and the transform, transpose of the features. So you just copy paste here. And here is what you use for the style loss. So we have the style image and the combination image. We get the gram matrix of both, which is S and C. And then we just apply this. Again, you just copy paste this, it works. Uh, and let's see the total variation loss. So the idea for the total variation loss is that uh, this will encourage the model to produce uh, something that is more uh, continuous and uh, the, the spatial continuity of the generated image. So we see that this works, it works better if we also add this. And this is why we add it. And again, don't uh, ask why we just uh, use this. You can copy paste this. It will probably work better with this. And we have, of course, to combine the three losses. So now we will see how we combine the three losses. First of all, we have to define which layers we will use for each loss. So the layers that we are going to use for the style uh, loss will be these. So the, from each block, we take conf one. We can take, for example, four of them or six of them. You know, it's up to us. So here is how many layers we will use for the style loss. And for the content loss, we just take the last uh, convolution layer and just one. That's all we need. And of course, we need to define some kind of weights uh, upon the these losses. And these numbers, I mean, uh, it's just experimenting. You try different numbers, you see what works. Uh, these are what the book proposes in this case. And here is how you compute the loss. So this is just a, a new loss function, let's say. We feed uh, the three images, so the combination image that we produce, the base image, and the style reference image. Uh, we concatenate them, so this will be the input tensor. Uh, we pass the input tensor, which is just a batch of the three images through the feature extractor, which is the model that takes the image and returns the output of each layer as a dictionary. These are the features, okay? And then we instantiate, we zero out a new loss and we take, so here what we do is from the features, we take the content layer name, which is this one. And we save this here. And uh, so this is for all three images, okay? This is both for the base image, the style image, and the combination. But what we want for the content is only the base and the combination, right? So we take the first and the third 
the base and the combination. We keep these two and we compute the loss. So the new loss will be whatever we had before, zero, plus the content weight, which we define here, where is it? Content weight here, times the content loss. And again, for the content loss, we just fit the activations of the base and the combination. So this here will be the content loss part. And now we have to compute the other two losses. So first one, we will compute the style loss. So for the style loss, we take each one of the layers that we define that we need want to use here, okay? And we will do the same thing. We take the features uh, of this uh, layer. Remember, this is a dictionary. And then we take uh, the second and the third. So we have the style image and again, the combination image. We take these two uh, uh, lists of, uh, of the activations and we pass them to the style loss. Again, we will use the gram matrix, et cetera. We compute the style loss and then we have to uh, add to the existing loss, whatever the style loss value is. And of course we have to weight it. So we use the style weight. And of course we have to, uh, to divide by how many uh, layers we used. Uh, so that if we add one more, it will, I mean, we balance it out here. And in the end, we have to compute the total variation loss. So the total variation loss is computed only on the combination image because we wanted to have this continuity that we mentioned. Uh, so we take the total variation weight, we multiply it with the variation loss and we add it to the loss and we just re return this. So this function will return the final combined loss of the three uh, kind of losses. And let's see how we can use it right now. So again, the idea is that we want to use the pre-trained model. We don't want to change the weights exactly of the model. We want to change the combined image. So the weights of the model, we remain the same. What will change is the produced image, the combined image. And we want to use backpropagation to change the pixel values of this image. Um, Okay, so this is how we do it. We have the compute loss and grads. We fit the three model, uh, the three images here, the combination, the base, and the style. Uh, we compute the loss, the function we just saw before, over these three. We take the loss with a gradient tape, of course. And then be careful here, we use, we want the grads of the loss with respect to the combination image. Again, we don't want to change the weights. We don't use some like, model dot trainable weights here. We change the combination image. And uh, here we will define an optimizer, nothing strange here, apart from this part, of course, because you can see here, we use a very, very big initial learning rate. Uh, and of course we decayed it, but still it's uh, very big. Uh, and we just take the images. So from the base image, we take the base image path we pre-process to take the base image. We use the style uh, reference image path for this. And for the combination image, uh, be careful, we use a TF variable because we want the values to change over the iterations. So it doesn't, it cannot be constant. And we use, we start, we instantiate with the base image. So we start with whatever this is, and then we slightly change every iteration to look more like this. And what we do here is that we just, okay, we will not run again this one, but the idea is that we compute the loss and the grads. We take the grads, and then we use the optimizer to apply the gradients that we computed again on the combination image. Be careful, not the weights of the model. Uh, and we just save it. So let's run this. And here you can see what will be the results. So I just load something that I have already saved. And this is more or less what it looks like in the end if you follow this. Not bad, uh, I mean, it's quite good. It, it, it is, uh, the content remains. I mean, here is what we had before, the houses, this small island, etc. Uh, and, and I think you can also see the bridge. And uh, of course the style looks somehow the style of the, uh, of the painting, so it's not bad. So the what is the problem with this technique? The problem is that uh, first of all, uh, this technique forms a uh, form of image retexture to texture transfer. The idea is that the algorithm is closer to 
classical signal processing rather than AI. We don't train a model, we just use a pre-trained model to make changes. Uh, and the other problem is that it's very, it's not a problem at first. The problem is that it's slow to run because for just to generate one uh, combined image, we have to run it many iterations. So what we can do to have faster results, we can just produce many pairs of input output, which we have to do this process again and again for each month. But then when we have these uh, samples, we can just train uh, a simple model uh, that convert the, uh, that learns this style specific transformation. So it takes the input images and produce the combination. So after we train this second model, we can just uh, use it, uh, the forward pass to generate a new image and it can be quite fast. It's just one forward pass. So this is more or less what you do. Uh, you create the pairs of what you want to, uh, to what kind of style you want to transfer and you train a new network to learn this. Uh, so this was the second part. And now we have the variational decoders and the GANs. So these go together, these two. Uh, let's start with the autoencoders. So the idea is that we're here we have to sample from a latent space of images. And what does this mean? So the idea is that we will develop a low dimension latent space, uh, which is just an, an array, uh, where every point can be mapped to a valid image. This is the target, the goal. So every point of this latent space should be able to be mapped to some valid generated image. And the process we follow after we train this is that we sample from the latent space, just a point, a vector. We feed this vector to the generator or decoder in case of uh, the bio, and then we take the generated image. And regarding the training, the idea is that uh, we have the training data, we feed with some learning process, we map this uh, data, this is the encoder, but we will see, we map these images to the latent space. Then we pick a point, uh, we sample a point from this latent space, and this is a vector that we feed, as I mentioned before, to the decoder, which produces the artificial image. So this is more or less the idea. And here we will see how we do this, the encoder part. Uh, so what is the difference between the variation of the and the GANs? Because both of them produce good results, but different kinds of results. So the idea for the VAE is that it's great for learning Latin spaces that are well structured. So the idea here is that we could e even map specific directions on the Latin space to have meaningful, uh, to encode meaningful notions, uh, meaningful axes of variation in the data. For example, uh, actually we will see an example of what I mean here. The bad thing with the GANs is that it cannot, I mean, although they are very good in producing very realistically, very realistic uh, images, the Latin space of GANs uh, doesn't have that much structure and continuity. So here we can see an example uh, of generated images. Uh, and all these, of course, are, I mean, they are artificial and there is uh, something even better with better results. If you, uh, I think the link, the, the name of the site is this person does not exist or something like this, where you can see very, very realistic images of faces of people that does, do not exist, that can be generated either with guns or with guns. So concept uh, vector for image editing. What I mentioned before, that the VAE, the variational decoder, has a very structured Latin space is this, is the concept vector. And the idea is that uh, certain directions of the space may encode interesting axes of the variation of the original input. For example, you might have one axis in the multi-dimensional Latin space that is the smile axis. So if you increase this, if you add this smile vector, then you get a face with smile, like here. So the more you increase this vector, the more smiley face you get. And of course, if you subtract it, you get something to the opposite direction, I guess. Uh, and you can use this for different uh, features. For example, add sunglasses. You can have a vector that is the sunglasses vector or the mustache vector or the male to female transformation vector for the features of the face or back. 
So there are many, so the idea is that you can use this kind of uh, concept vectors to change an image based on what you want as a result. Let's see how this works, the variation autoencoder. So first of all, we will see the classical autoencoder. The idea for the classical is that we feed it an image. It takes the image and it encodes it to a, a smaller dimension, a small di smaller uh, dimension uh, Latin space. And then we take this uh, point where it maps the input image. We feed this point, this vector to the decoder and it decodes back to the original image. So the idea is that the target image and the input image will be the same. And we want to train an, an autoencoder to do this uh, mapping. And in practice, the classical autoencoder doesn't create very useful Latin spaces. So this is more or less what it does. We take the image, we fit to the encoder, we get the compressed representation of this, we fit it to the decoder, and the decoder tries to reconstruct the original input. Now, uh, what is the solution for this problem that doesn't have very useful Latin spaces? The solution is not to map the image to a fixed point in the Latin space, but to have the image transformed to parameters of a statistical distribution. For example, for a normal distribution, these parameters would be the mean and the variance. And then we randomly sample from this distribution. And the idea is that the point that we sample should be mapped back to the original input. And this stochasticity, because we sample from this distribution, improves the robustness of the Latin space and forces the Latin space to encode meaningful representation, not only to the specific point as the autoencoder, but to the area around. So, which means that it makes representations everywhere in the, or almost everywhere in the Latin space. So, and thus the, every point sampled from this new, this based on the stochastic Latin space will be decoded to something that is quite valid output. So here are the steps. We have the input image for the variation autoencoder. We feed the image to the encoder and we get the parameters of this distribution. Then we take this distribution and we randomly sample from this distribution with some value epsilon, which is produced, well, randomly in order to have this send. So this send is just a sample from, from this distribution with the send mean and the send log variance multiplied by this random number. And then we fit this Zend uh, sample from the Latin space to the decoder, and we try to regenerate the input image. And again, this epsilon value is just random. Every point close to the Latin location can be decoded to an input, the input back to the input image. And this is what it looks like. So we don't have just a fixed the, uh, encoding here. We have a distribution, we sample from this distribution, we feed this point to the decoder and we get the reconstructed image. And this is the schematic. So this is more or less what we are going to encode here. We have the input image, we pass it through the encoder. We get these two vectors. Again, this is not a number. This is a vector because we can have multiple dimensional uh, uh, Latin space, of course. So we get these two vectors and we generate an epsilon, a random number. We sample based on this epsilon and these parameters, a point Z. We feed this point Z to the decoder and the decoder outputs the reconstructed image. So the idea is that the model will take as input the input image, as input the whatever image, and try to, and try to produce this reconstructed image as output. Uh, in order to do this, we use two loss functions. So we have the reconstruction loss. Uh, of course, we want the two final, I mean, the original image and the output image to look more or less the same. So we need some kind of reconstruction loss. But we also need the regularization loss. So this will be something like a callback labeler divergence, which uh, seems to be very helpful for learning well-rounded Latin distributions. And it also helps in reducing the overfit of the training data. So we will use both of these losses in the virtual autoencoder. Now let's see how we can actually implement this thing uh, in Keras. So we will use the MNIST digits uh, dataset. These are uh, the three parts of the encoder. Again, 
feed any match, output, mid, mean, and variance. The sampling layer that introduced the stochasticity takes these two and produces a point, a vector from the, for the, from the latent space. And the decoder that takes this point and produces the image. And this is what the network looks like. So it's quite uh, simple. So here we have the encoder inputs so that will be just the uh, MNIST digits, so 28 by 28 by one. Uh, we define what is the dimensionality of the, latent D, of the latent space. Here we define two so that we can visualize, but of course you can have higher dimensionality. And this is the encoder. So we, we just have a convolution to D, uh, 32, another convolution, 64. These numbers here are more or less uh, standard, activation relu, strides two, because we're going to get bigger and bigger and padding same, so nothing strange here. In the end, we flatten. Again, remember here, we want to have the two outputs. So we flatten and we have a dense layer. Uh, that is the intermediate the encoding. And then we have two outputs here. One output uh, with latent dimension, which will be the mean, the Z mean over this. And another output on the same X, so this one for both layers, again, Two, out, two Latin dimension of two, as we defined, and this will be the log var. So these will be the two outputs, and that's why we have a list of these two. And the input, of course, will be the encoder inputs. So we define this model, and the name of this model will be encoder. Let's see the summary. So the idea is that we have whatever input uh, we have here, 28 by 28 by one. And we just have the two convolution, we flatten it, uh, something intermediate, and we have two outputs here, okay? The mean and the var. Let's continue and see how we can make the second part. So we have the encoder, the sampling layer, and the decoder. This is a sampling layer. So for the sampler, this is just a Keras layers layer object. So we just uh, inherit. And we have to define the call function, so that's all. We take two inputs, which again will be the outputs of the encoder. Uh, we get the bat size, the zen size, just uh, from the shape. And then we generate an epsilon value, which will be just uh, from the normal distribution and will have this dimensionality. And we apply what we saw before. So this uh, operation, just the mean plus the exponential of the zen bar and divide by two. And then we multiply by this epsilon in order to randomly sample from this distribution. And let's move to the third part, which is the decoder. So again, the decoder takes this end point and maps it to, and produces the, tries to reconstruct the input image. So the inputs will be just uh, the point. So the dimensionality is the Latin theme. And then we try to do the opposite from before. So we start, if you remember, we, the last layer was seven by seven by 64. So we start with seven times seven times 64, which then we resave to start with this. And then we use come to the transpose in order to make it uh, bigger. So we start from seven by seven, and then uh, I guess here it will be 14 by 14, and then 28 by 28, because we use strides two. So again, for conf 2 d transpose, it's getting bigger with strides two, not smaller. And here we use just the reverse numbers that we used before. And the output will be just uh, the convolution layer with one uh, kernel because we want 28 by 28 by one, if you remember, it's a grayscale. And uh, we want numbers between zero and one, so sigmoids and nothing strange here. And the actual model will take whatever this point from the Latin space and will return the reconstructed image, the decoder output. And let's see the summaries. So we start by with one vector of dimensionality two in this case, and we produce this, we reshape it to this, we make it bigger and we make it even bigger, and then we make it one channel from zero to one. So pretty straightforward. And let's see what is the train step. So here we will use, I mean, there is another way to do it, but maybe the easier way is just to inherit from model. So we just pass the encoder and the decoder models 
here we instantiate the uh, super, the model class. We assign them, we take the sampler, which this sampler is the function that we defined before. Uh, and we use some trackers for the total loss, the reconstruction loss, and the KL loss. So these are just trackers with me. Uh, we define a property metrics that just returns a list of the three losses, the total and the two reconstruction and KL loss. And here is what actually is the important. So first of all, of course, we open a gradient tape. We pass whatever data, the images, the batches of images through the encoder. The encoder returns two vectors, the mean and the log bar. And we pass these two through the sampler, which returns a point, a randomly sampled point from the Latin space. We feed this point to the decoder and we get the reconstructed image. And then based on this reconstructed image, we can compute the losses. So here we have the reconstruction loss, which is just the input and this reconstructed uh, using binary cross entropy. So nothing uh, special here, we reduce mean. And this is what is the KL loss, just copy paste this. And of course the total loss is <clears throat> the sum of these two losses. Uh, now we have to get the gradients and of course uh, back propagate. So we have the total loss applied on the self-trainable weights. And we get this grad and we apply it on the trainable weights, which of course include both. Uh, we will see exactly what happens here. So, and we update the state of all these three uh, losses. And of course we, re we return the dictionary with the whatever loss dot result to get the actual result which is the mean up to that point because we use the tracker. So let's see how we can train this uh, variation autoencoder. Uh, so we have the, uh, we just load the MNIST, we concatenate both the train and the test. Uh, so we use everything. Uh, we divide by 255, we define the model here and we compile the model using Adam. Uh, we run this. Of course, we should have fit. I already fit it. So let's see what this produces. It will take some time. So here, more or less, what I do is that, if you remember, we have two numbers, uh, the vector space, the, the vector size for the Latin uh, space is two. So we get uh, a linear space. So we get numbers for minus one, two, one, and we make a grid for all the combinations of uh, mean as, uh, of the, X and the Y in this uh, Latin space. And we produce the results. So this is what it looks like. And here you can see all the numbers, all the 10 digits in different areas. For example, up here, you can see the nines. Here are the eights. Down here are the twos, the fives, the zeros, etc. So here are the threes. So all the numbers are mapped somewhere here. So this was more or less how the variation of the coder works. We take the Input image, we produce uh, the parameters of a, a distribution, we sample from this distribution, and we try to reconstruct based on this sampled point. Oops, I didn't want to do this. I'm going to go to guns. And this is the last one from the four that I mentioned before. Uh, guns, very important, very good results, very difficult to uh, train, uh, but it works if you are patient enough. So the main idea for GANS is uh, something that is usually, is commonly used as a, an example of how it works is the forger example. So you have someone that uh, tries to paint fake Picassos, let's say, and you have on the other hand, the art dealer that says to the forger, hey, it's not very good here or here. Then the forger uh, tries to paint a better Picasso. The, our dealers uh, gives a feedback, how to make it better. So this continues uh, the two uh, roles. Uh, one tries to generate a better output and the other part gives feedback on it does look realistic or it doesn't based on what is the realistic in any case. And both of them get better. So there are two parts as we saw here in the example, the generator and the discriminator. The generator just uh, takes some random vector uh, from, again, a random point from the Latin space and 
produces a synthetic image, more or less what the decoder does in the vibe. Now the discriminator takes an image, either real or synth synthesized or fake, uh, synthetic, and is just a classifier. So it takes an image and classifies as zero or one, real or fake prediction. Uh, this is schematically how it works. We have uh, the latent space, we randomly sample, we feed this to the generator and the generator produ produces some image. Uh, we take these images and also real images and we feed them to the discriminator. The discriminator classifies the image as real or fake. And based on the feedback, it gets better because we train the classifier. But also at the second phase, based on this feedback, the generator gets some feedback and gets better. And we will see exactly how this works. It's a bit more complicated than the by. So schematic gun implementation. First of all, you can see what you can theoretically uh, produce. We will not produce so beautiful images. We will produce a bit less beautiful images. Uh, here's an example of the DC gun, which is just one of the, I think the first uh, gun based on deep convolution. Uh, pretty simple. And of course, since then it has become more and more good and of course complicated and complex. Uh, we will keep it simple. We have a generator that takes from the Latin space produce 64 by 64 by three. Then we have the discriminator takes this whatever 64 by 64 by three outputs a number between zero and one. And here is what it looks like. So we have whatever X the length from the Latin space, we fit the generator, produce the image, we fit the image to the discriminator, and this is more or less what the gun is. Uh, the discriminator training is same as whatever classifier we have seen. The generator training on the other hand uh, uses, so the generator's gradients with regard to the gun loss. And we will see what this exactly means. The problem here is that, uh, so we want to move the weights of the generator in a direction that makes the discriminator more likely to classify it as real. So the idea uh, when we try to train the generator is that it produces an image, we feed the image to the discriminator and we want the feedback to be as if this image was real. Uh, let's see how this works. Now, before we start, a bag of tricks that makes our life much easier. First of all, uh, as it's written in the book, it's, uh, the guns are more of an alchemy than science, which means that you try something, if it works, it's good. If it doesn't work, you don't use it. It's not that you have to ground it uh, to some theoretical background or uh, reference. Uh, we have seen that these things work, so we use them. Uh, strides instead of pulling or downsampling uh, works better. Normal distribution instead of uniform distribution works better for the Latin space. Uh, we have to introduce some kind of randomness somehow. So what we do here is that we change the labels. We add some noise to the labels before we feed them to the discriminator. Uh, we try to avoid anything that produces sparse gradients like again, max pooling and relu. So instead of relu, we will use a leaky relu so that even the negative numbers return some uh, gradient. And in order to avoid these checkboard artifacts, uh, we will have to have the kernel size to be divisible by the stride size. So if we will use stride size two, it should be two or four or six or something like this, not three as we usually do. Oh, let's uh, start with Celebe. Oh, we have to start running because it's huge. So the idea for Celebe is just a, uh... oh, this was fast, okay, uh, strange. Celebe is just a, uh, a data set that uh, has faces of uh, celebrities, of uh, famous people. So many of them, as you can see, 202,000 something. Uh, usually this takes a long time to load, so maybe something went wrong. Here we just uh, divide by 255, uh, which makes it uh, from zero to one, nothing strange. And let's see what an image looks like. So this is a 64 by 64 version of the image. So this is what we will try to replicate. Again, not the very big high resolution images, just that for the moment. 
No, let's uh, continue and start building stuff. First of all, the discriminator. This is the discriminator. Again, the discriminator is just a gun and that uh, classifies images. So we take whatever input, the image, we apply conf, lickerelu, conf, lickerelu, conf, lickerelu, flatten, dropout, important. And the output would be just one number between zero and one. Be careful here, we use again four because we want it to be divisible by the number of strides. This is quite simple. Let's move. Let's first of all plot it, the summary. So 32 by 32 by 64. We start from this and we end with one number. Now, the generator. The generator is this. Again, more or less what we use for the uh, decoder of the vibe. So we take whatever is a Latin space, we produce something that is, we can reshape it to something that we can use. So in this case, eight by eight by 128. And then we start making it bigger. So we use come to the transpose, same as the decoder. Uh, one with liquor loo, second with liquor loo, third with liquor loo. And the output, we want to have three color channels. And here we can use whatever kernel size we want. And we use activation sigmoid. And let's see what it looks like. So the idea is that we start with whatever we have, uh, the Latin dimensionality. We produce this, we reshape it, and we start growing it to 64 by 64, and in the end by three, okay? So again, nothing too complicated here. The complicated part will be here. Well, next slide. So what we will see in the next slide. Uh, first of all, we have to draw a random point from the Latin space. With Whatever we just dimension that we find. We generate images with the generator using some random noise. Then we mix these generated images with real ones. We feed them to the discriminator and we try to train it to classify correctly. Then, second phase. This is the first phase, and this is where we train the discriminator. The second phase is where we train the uh the uh the generator, the, 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 the first part. So we draw new random points from the latter space, and then we train the generator using the random vectors with targets that say these are real images. So this is important point. And this is how it works. Again, we will inherit from model. Uh, it's simpler maybe that way. Uh, we fit these two models and whatever land and dimensionality we need, we instantiate super, we assign them. And here we have the tracker. So the, drag, the tracker for the discriminator loss and the tracker for the generator loss. We define internally compile. Okay, so we fit the two optimizers to compile and the loss function. The loss function is one, is the one that will be used for the discriminator. We instant we run super compile and then we assign these to optimizers to use them later on and of course the loss function. The metrics will be just uh, the uh, list of the two metrics: the discriminator loss and the generator loss. And here is the train step. So let's see what we do here. Here we feed first of all real images, batches of real images. Then we <coughs> take the shape of the batch size. Uh, the, the, the bat size from the shape. And we here, we create some uh, random samples from the, some we sample from the uh, Latin space. So we use this random normal uh, and we create vectors of well, how many uh, images we have in bat size and this Latin dimensionality. So we take these, lat these vectors from the Latin space and based on this, we generate some images using the generator. So these are the generated images. Then we concatenate the generated and the real images to the bigger batch, mm -hmm. double size from the original one. And we create the labels. So the labels from the, for the generated images will be ones, and for the real images will be zeros, let's say, or whatever we want actually. And here is where we add the stochasticity to the labels, if you remember. So we just add a, a random number between minus 0.5 and 0.5 to each one of them. 
And here is the first phase. The first phase, again, we try to train the discriminator. So we feed these combined images, again, both uh, generated and real images. We take the predictions and we use the labels that we defined here, the stochastic label, well, these labels, and the predictions. And based on this, on the loss function, we get the D loss, the loss for the discriminator. And we want the gradients of this D loss for the discriminator trainable weights. Remember here we train the discriminator. And then of course we apply the gradients for the, using the D optimizer. Remember we have two optimizers and we use these grads with the discriminator trainable weights. So this is the first phase. Now let's move to the generator. Again, same thing. We generate some random Latin vectors. And this time we use misleading labels. So we use the label, the zeros that we use for the real images. Why? Because we want to backpropagate what would be, what would make the generated images look more realistic. So same as before, we get the generator, we fit these uh, Latin vectors, we generate images, and then we fit these images to the discriminator. We get the predictions of the discriminator based on these uh, uh, generated images. And then we use the same loss function, but with the misleading labels and the predictions. Again, we want these uh, gradients to make the gun, the, the generator towards uh, generating realistic images. So we do this and we get the generator loss, and then we get the grads of the generator loss uh, with respect to the generator trainable weights this time. Uh, we apply the gradients uh, using the generator optimizer, and then we just update the state and return the results. So let's see. Ah, also, we will use just a callback to generate every some epochs uh, some images. Nothing special here. So it just saves the predicted, the generated images uh, every few epochs. Uh, let's compile. Uh, first of all, we create the gun. Again, we feed here the discriminator, the generator, and whatever Latin dimensionality we have. And to compile, we have these two optimizers plus the loss function, which in this case will be binary cross entropy. We would fit, I already fitted it, and here is how we generate the results. Uh, so again, we use a callback. Uh, I, I use the callback, I save the images, and then we just plot them. They look like faces, so they are not perfect, but at least you can say they look like faces. So this is more or less uh, how GAN works. Of course, you can make it even more complicated and produce better results. Uh, it was, I mean, we are quite over time. Four different things. Let's summarize and close the session. First of all, uh, we saw the text generation with sequence to sequence model. The idea is that we can generate sequence data one step at a time, and this can apply either to the text generation, as we saw, or any other kind of uh, time series data. And then we move to the style transfer algorithm, where we have the content image, the style image, and then we produce the combined image using gradient descent. And they produce, uh, the idea is to produce an image with the high level features of the content image and the lower local characteristic of the style image. And after that, we move to the pass, uh, the variation of the colors and the guns. So here, the idea is that we learn a Latin space of images. And then we, after we learn this, we can sample from this and produce new images. And we also talked about the concept vectors. Of course, we didn't see how exactly we can produce them. But the idea with the concept vectors is that we can add or remove some features from the generated image. So that would be all. Uh, thank you very much. This is the end of the presentation.